Okay, um, Saturday morning in Chapel Hill dates back to 1981, and it's a throw off of Sunday morning. And in 1981, Charles Corralt was in Memorial Hall for the inaugural Saturday morning in Chapel Hill. And over the years, it's evolved and changed in location and format. In the early years, for several years, we had a debate contest or a quiz between a team of students who were on the debate team when they were here and uh, a group of alumni. What we didn't tell the alumni was that we doctored the questions. So it was very competitive. When we got close to the bicentennial, we used it one occasion to uh, launch some of the observance activities for the bicentennial. And over the years, we've also had different uh, moderators. Um, Raleigh Tillman uh, was then Vice Chancellor for University Relations and did it for a while. Dick Richardson was Provost. Most recently, for several years, Dick Bedour, who started his career in student affairs, did it. And um, he recently decided that he needed to step aside and hand it off to a younger colleague with whom he worked in student affairs. And the younger colleague is a member of our class of 1970, whose bio you've seen in the materials, but who has uh, done remarkable things over the course of his profession, but most importantly, as a key volunteer leader, both at the Board of Trustees, the General Alumni Association, instrumental in the forming of the School of Government, and a number of other things. He's received a Distinguished Service Medal for the association, as well as a uh, uh, Distinguished Alumni Award from the university. So with no further ado, I will hand it back to Richard Stevens, class of 70. He's got a couple of other degrees from Carolina, but the one we care about today is from class of 70. Thank you, Doug. Good morning, everybody. I'm assuming our colleagues were out on Franklin Street last night and didn't remember 8 o'clock classes. Glad that those of you who are here are here. Uh, this is going to be a light session. The next two are very important and heavy and serious sessions on artificial intelligence, which I possibly could not do. Um, and some other topic I forgot in medicine. So this is going to be a fun one. Uh, we're, we're pleased to have four students with us and four alums, two from the class of 70 and, and two from the class of, of 72. Let me ask them to just take one moment and talk about where they're from and, and originally where they are now with the alumni, and then quickly, same with the students. We'll start with, with Ben. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Ben Boykin. I'm originally from the farm, Garland, North Carolina, currently residing in White Plains, New York. I'm Catherine Cawthorn, originally from Richmond, Virginia, and I am presently living and plan to until the day I die, Hancock, New Hampshire. I'm Gwen Waddell Schultz. I am, uh, grew up in Oxford, North Carolina, came to Chapel Hill, and never left. I'm Bob Manick, and I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland, and I still live in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, X number of years later, I'm what I call a homeboy. Let's we'll start with Andrew. And Hi, I'm Andrew Spratley. I'm currently a rising sophomore. I'm majoring in physics and public policy. I'm from New Bern, so about two and a half hours east. And so I'm hoping for a better two years than an online semester. <laughs> My name is Lexi Bell. I'm a senior. I'm graduating tomorrow. So, hey. <laughs> and um, I'm from Hickory, North Carolina, and I'm majoring in biostatistics. My name is Lillian. I am from McLean, Virginia, and I'm a rising senior majoring in biology and minoring in marine science and geographic information science. Hey, you guys. My name's Bo Bell. As you can see by my makeshift <clears throat> name tag, I was not meant to do this today, but I am Lexi's brother. I'm a sophomore, and I'm majoring in management society, so I'm excited. Thanks to all of you. Gwen, then Hightower, Waddell Schultz came from Oxford in the fall of 1966. Gwen, tell us about arriving in Chapel Hill, how you got here, uh, what it was like, what was moving in like, what kind of appliances did you have at, at your dorm? Um, wow, well, my parents drove me up from uh, Garland, North Carolina on old 
55, because it didn't have any throughways, brought me to Alexander Hall, where I spent four and a half years, and moved in. Uh, there was no time limit. We moved in. Then I met my roommate, who was from Clinton, I mean, who was from Wilmington. Um, my parents took me to Bauman Hall to pay bills, which you could do back then. You don't do it anymore. And when I came back, I got a shock that my roommate had moved out. And he was not going to room with someone looking like me. And I was left alone in the room in Alexander Dormitory. That was August 1968. What appliances did you have with you? Huh? Oh, we had no appliances. I mean, you know. There were no cell phones. There was nothing. In fact, we were talking yesterday. Um, there was only a dorm phone in each of the hallways. Mm -hmm. So if you got a call, someone would come out. They probably knew where you stayed and said, hey, you got a phone call. Very different than today. Now let's contrast that with, with Lexi. Um, how many U-Hauls did you bring? <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> a packed car. We couldn't see out of the back. So um, my parents moved me in, and we did have a time limit, so it was snappy. Um, appliances, I had everything decked out. Um, mini fridge with, like, a microwave on top, so set in the bedroom, you know. It was it was good, good stuff. I lived in Horton Residence Hall, so, um, and I moved in uh, the fall of 2018, so... You know, it, it was really good. It was interesting, not super climactic. My parents both went to UNC as well, so it was a good experience, a lot of crying, and then we went out on Franklin Street. So it was fun. Bob, you came down from Baltimore. I'm sure you brought a lot of stuff with you. Uh, you didn't know my mother. <laughs> uh, my parents drove me down, um, dropped me off. We were at Morrison. Uh, with the exception of one fraternity week in my sophomore year, that they, they never came back to campus. And I never walked in graduation, which is why I'm excited about it tomorrow. And how often did you talk to them, Bob, by phone? Uh, as, as little as I could. I did have to write. <laughs> I, 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 was a pretty, I was a pretty good letter writer. Uh, I, I found it, it was easier to manage the conversation if I just sort of put it in writing. But I really rarely called them, and they rarely called me. Did you, also, what, you lived in what dorm? Marson. So you had an Fort actual Fort. phone in your room. Uh, I don't, actually, you may be right, but I just don't remember using it much. <laughs> Never calling home. Whereas most of us, like Ben and I, had a hall. hall oh, phone. yeah. So, how about you, Lynn? How often did you talk to your parents that freshman year? Um, I recall falling asleep once when I was supposed to call my parents. So I got in trouble for that. Um, depending on the week during final exams when I didn't want to study, I probably called them more often. It's very different when you have a phone in your hand versus the way Ben and I did with one down the hall, for yeah. sure. Um, ben mentioned about our class. Uh, he was one of the very few uh, African-American members of our class. Kelly Alexander, uh, still know Kelly. Uh, all these years later, we served together in the legislature. Uh, but very, very small numbers, Ben. Uh, Gwen and Catherine, you were 10% of our class, I think. What was that It was, was a like? one to five ratio. What was that like? It was nice. <laughs> um, I came, I was accepted uh, as uh, in the nursing program, and it was the first year, 1966, fall of 66, that women were admitted as freshmen. Prior to that, you had to be transferred from, you know, as a junior or sophomore, some of the PT um, and some of the other professions, you know, came as sophomores, but you were, cannot come as a freshman unless you were in the nursing program. And our class was the first class that um, was the two plus two um, curriculum. So we had two years of general college, although we were admitted to the School of Nursing, our actual nursing courses didn't start until junior year. So we had a lot of time to enjoy campus. <laughs> so Andrew, there's a little different numbers now for you in terms of men and women. What's it like today? I, I, I talked to him, a physics major, right? <laughs> well, let me go, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, I, I can say I'm currently single if you're talking about dating. Um, so what's the ratio? Of men it's, it's roughly uh, four to six, so 40% male, 60% female. When you wanted to get a date, Bob, and you didn't know Gwen yet, uh, what did you do? 
it's, I, I hung out with my friends a lot. No, occasionally we, 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 we would go to uh, Greensboro. Um, on, ra on rare occasions for me, I was at a disadvantage since I was from out of state, okay? <laughs> and I knew where to go, but I didn't know who to see when I got there. Uh, so I, I had a fairly modest social life my, my freshman year. Uh, it improved when I rushed a fraternity, uh, but it was amazing how few women were on the campus as undergraduates back then as opposed to now. Yeah. Correction, what? there were buses from UNC Greensboro yeah. Yeah. that showed up every time we had a mixer or an event on campus. I'm glad you added that. I don't know why I didn't remember that. Maybe it's, maybe it's because I didn't get a date from we, it. I don't know. <laughs> Catherine, Catherine. Well, what I wanted to share is what, uh, with our one hall phone, we used to have contests every weekend on how many um, date requests one would get, and whoever won got a special gift, which usually involved kind of intimidating and humiliating our prospective date. Um, because, of course, we had to kind of be checked out by everybody to make sure it was okay. And we weren't allowed to necessarily, originally, to have our dates in, in our room. L later on, we could have one, but the door had to be cracked. So um, there was a lot of supervision. There was a lot of um, concern about the welfare of um, the women by Kitty Carmichael. Um, we had different dress code than the men. Um, we had different, we had a, a curfew. Men didn't have a curfew. Men didn't have any rules at all, quite frankly. Um, but why did I come here? Because it was, I thought it was like 1,400 women to 14,000 men, something like that. And I thought that ratio sounded good because I had been 12 years in a um, private Episcopal all women school, and man, I was just ready for guys. <laughs> So off I went, and I will tell you one last thing. Being from Virginia, I had a stronger southern accent than I do now. I got down here, and I decided to really like the northern men. I thought they were really cute. So I decided, in the Pygmalion way, to get rid of my southern accent because they would kind of look at me and go, oh, my God, she's stupid. <laughs> so I went, I want to get rid of that accent. So I literally stood in front of a mirror day after day, and I wiped it out pretty much. So instead of a house around the, you know, blah, 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 my Tidewater Virginia accent, I got rid of it. But it comes out with a couple of glasses of wine. <laughs> and what about you? There weren't many African Americans here. What about African American women? Uh, very few. I mean, um, I think we had maybe 50 Someone told me 100, but I couldn't find them. <laughs> uh, and this morning, I will introduce my two daughters that are here, Lysandra, 2000, and Dr. Boykin, uh, 2005. So uh, they're with me this morning. Um, but I mean, for us, uh, we were all, if you were black, you became a member of the Black Student Movement, which is still a very vibrant organization on campus. And we were be in the union. That's where we would find us uh, socializing. Some of us actually went to the library occasionally and all. But it was sparse for us as people of color on this campus. My initials are BB, and I tell people before blacks. Some of you were here yesterday for the basketball players, and Charlie Scott yeah, mentioned Charlie going, Scott. To, going to Durham to date uh, women who lived yeah. in Durham, not even in, in Chapel Hill. Bo, you want to chime in on any of this? Arriving, dating. Um, so something I will say is I think it's interesting to hear that women had dress codes because now people like men and women show up to classes at 8 a.m. in some sweats and some questionable clothing. <laughs> and especially with exams and finals that just came, people just come in anything and everything. So I think that's interesting to hear that people used to have dress codes. Austrian athletics. Um, most of us went to football, basketball games. Um, Gwen, tell us about going to the football game on Saturday. After your 8 o'clock well, class. Before we came to Carolina, we had a big sister assigned to us, and we got a letter, and it had a list of things to bring with you. And one of those, I have to say this, was you had to have a London Fog raincoat because women were not allowed to wear pants on campus. Mm -hmm. So we would roll our pants up and wear the London Fog raincoat across campus. We got to Franklin Street, we'd take off the coat, and we could have our pants on. But we wore suits, um, we dressed for football games, uh, the guys wore uh, coat and tie, 
and um, that was, you know, that was the dress code. And a nurse's dorm is like right behind Keenan Stadium is where the Student Health Center is now. So, of course, everybody went because you couldn't do anything else because of the noise. I mean, it, it, was, it was really wonderful. Uh, but that was the dress code. Ben, what did you wear to a football game? Uh, for the ones that I went to, I was used to studying. Um, I just would be a t I don't think I had a tie. I didn't have many ties. It was a shirt, you know, we dressed and um, come and enjoy the game. It's, uh, but I don't remember having a dress code. I don't. Or if the we men, did, I surely didn't, didn't obey it. Men didn't. The no. women did. <laughs> Catherine Carmichael said women were small, yeah. delicate, and precious. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's right. In 1966, the rule book for women, we came 10 days early to because we had to commit to memory the rule book. And when we left in 1970, the rule book was four pages long. So we did a lot of work in those four years. Alexa, mm -hmm. tell us about football games. Nowadays. Yes, Lexi. Oops, sorry. I did not hear. You can say my name. Um, football games now, definitely like tailgating is really big. I'm never really engaged in any of that, but my brother definitely does. So um, <laughs> I would say dress code. Girls just wear really cute outfits to the football games, big earrings, just anything like to show off to the guys. You know, it's 60 to 40. You got to like get what you can get. So um, <laughs> then um, basketball's a little bit different. Everyone wears jerseys, but you know, it's a good time. I grew up going to football games with my family. So football is a bit closer to my heart, even though we're not as good at football as we are with basketball, but you know, we did pretty good the years I was here, so it's good. Bob, I've heard this term pre-game. I'm not, I think I know what that means, but and I know you don't do it, but tell us what you've heard about pre-game. Yeah, so this is before the game, hence pre. Um, usually at my fraternity, we um, will hold a party and we'll, um, we'll even have some like cool events. Sometimes we'll have a band play. We've had a water slide before a game. And we tailgate out, and we um, kind of all just sit around and chat, take photos with each other. And then my family, um, before in the past, has rented out a tent by the bell tower. So me and a couple of my fraternity brothers will go and say hey to my family and say hey to the friends around us as we make our way to the game. So that's kind of what we do before. Let's turn to basketball. Okay. How did you get basketball tickets? Can uh, I just say? Okay. Oh, I wanted to say yeah. about... Um, Title IX had not happened yet right. uh, when we were here. It was the year after 71 when we left. Yeah. So there were no women's sports. There was not women's basketball. There were club sports. Right. But football and basketball was it. Was it? Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of campus activities were surrounded by that. But you could go down to Carmichael on the day of the game and get basketball tickets. And you go with your date, you know, and get um, tickets. And stand in line. Over. Stand in line if there was a line, but sometimes it mean there wasn't a line. I know. It, what, it didn't take a lot of effort at all. No. Same with football. You just lined up out here and walked in. I think we, I think we just used to show that ID. Show your student pass. Student mm -hmm. ID. Student I, don't, pass. I don't think it mattered because when we were here, you stayed till the end of the game to avoid traffic. <laughs> <laughs> not, I mean, as far as the, the, the team, I, I, getting tickets it was never a problem mm -hmm. for football. It was always an issue for basketball as far as lining up and, and IDs and things like that. Glenn, you go to basketball games? I have been unlucky and not gotten very many lottery tickets to the basketball so games so explain far. Explain that. How, do you, how would you get a basketball ticket? Yeah, so we have a student lottery for every um, home game, and I don't understand the full point system, but some people have greater priority in the lottery. For example, <laughs> seniors get greater priority, and there are also fever points that you can accumulate by going to other sporting events to up your chances of getting basketball tickets. You have any experience with that, Andrew? Basketball? I personally have gone to just about every game, save the Duke game and the Michigan game, because I was not here for that one. Um, and also all the football games, too. Uh, that as Lily was talking about the fever points, I go to a lot of other sports as well, so lacrosse, baseball, soccer. Um, and so you can get points to boost your ranking. Uh, and get tickets over other people. And that, and I also have my roommates to thank since we get two now. And if I don't get a ticket, odds are one of the, them have it, so. Bob, you were kind of a jock. Did you do that intramurals? 
Excuse me? Do intramurals? Did I participate in intramurals? Yeah. Absolutely. Tell us about that. Buck Goldstein and I were uh, an intramural team that uh, represented the ZBT house against Jimmy Delaney and Eddie Fogler in the, in the Tep House. Um, and we had some intramural basketballs. I was playing lacrosse at the time, so I was sort of exempted. But um, it, was a, it was a big deal. And the facilities were a little different. As a matter of fact, I got a nail. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the, the turf field where the intramurals are and things like that. Uh, there were nails in the field when we were playing these football games. You had to watch out that you didn't pull one in your, you know, you pull one in your shoe. It was, it was. Otherwise, you're going to see Gwen. But no, <laughs> it was, it was. I think it was. There was a very active intramural program for both fraternity, fraternity and non fraternity dorms, etc. How about now? If intramurals were they active at all? Both? I yeah, I play volleyball intramurals. So I've played in like beach volleyball tournaments, and a lot of members of my fraternity play. Um, flag football, they've played soccer intramurals, um, basketball like intramurals, and we have kind of a backyard basketball league we title BBL within our fraternity that we um, have a draft at the beginning of each semester and then we get to pick members and then kind of that is a, um, a gathering of the, the brotherhood that comes to watch those events. So that's some of the involvement I've had with intramurals. Well, let's turn to academics. That's why we're mainly here, right? <laughs> Catherine, tell us about signing up for classes Getting into classes, changing classes. You do it in person. <laughs> it's, no, it's nothing on the computer. Um, in fact, I'll just tell you something. I came back and got my doctorate, and um, I had to take a computer science class for my language, and the computers were about as big as this area here. You know, they were huge. They took up a whole room. And um, so we didn't have computers. You had to sign up, uh, you know, Parts. get your classes. <laughs> Um, drop ad was in person. You had an advisor. Our, we had a prescribed curriculum, and so we just mm -hmm. signed up. That was it, um, and did our thing. And especially at eight o'clock on Saturday morning, it always seemed to be the most regrettable, difficult, and requiring a lot of consciousness and awakeness, more so than most of the students. For the students here, almost all of us had six eight o'clock classes, meaning. Monday through Saturday. Not heard of, right? German. 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 There you go. There you go. Yeah, you go. I, ha I had chemistry or biology, and you would walk out of the class, and the crowds were already going to the football field. And you would go, oh, my God, I've got to hurry. So you would run to your dorm and get ready for the football game. I got no sympathy. I had 8 o'clock ROTC classes. <laughs> I mean, you could stagger into a chemistry class or a history class and sort of do your thing, but, you know, on 8 o'clock Saturday morning, if you had to wear a uniform or you're alert, they, they made a point of it. It was now, ugly. Ben, uh, Catherine mentioned drop ad. I don't think these students know exactly what that is, the way we do it. Uh, yeah. In other words, you would, have, you would have signed up for your courses. You would then decide, oh, I really don't want to do that course, or I went to German, and the latest is Sprechensi Deutsch. There will be no more English speaking. I'm like, I can't wait to go to drop ad and get out of a German. <laughs> so you would literally go and say, I don't want to be in the German class. And you, you have a list of trying the new classes that you wanted to get in. And I think you could list a couple and hope you got your first choice to get in. In person and all. And then you'd get a new schedule. And that would be your classes that you would go to. Now, how long did it take to do this drop ad? Well, I mean, you know, you've got round one, and, you know, then you may go again, decide, ooh, I don't want to do this either, mm -hmm. and you go through another yeah. of drop ad. Now, as you get into your upper-level courses, obviously you had to take a lot of them. I was in business major in accounting, um, and, you know, as you got up, you would, there would be less classes to drop, or if there were two courses competing, you'd say, ooh, I need this course before that course. So, but it was all in person. No computer, in person, yeah. and all, and you had to make sure you got it right. Because what, there was a, a, there was a time for drop ad. Yeah. After that time limit, that you were done, mm -hmm. you were in the course. The only thing you could do later, at a, to a certain point, you could drop that course. Obviously, you dropped down from 15 to 12 hours or whatever you were, and you were locked in. And what I remember also, in addition to that, was the line started past the bell tower and went to Woolen Gym. Yes, yeah. the Woolen Gym to for your drop ad. It yeah. was 
it was it was an ugly situation it was an ugly long painful situation but everybody was doing it i mean it was no other option to do it at that point well i think also remember we didn't we obviously had choices but that doesn't mean you didn't get your third choice or you couldn't get any of them and then you'd go back to the planning board and try to figure out oh my god and the time was ticking and so you were under pressure to find what you wanted if you wanted to maintain a 15 hour semester right. you know, course load. So it, it was kind of stressful, actually. And Andrew, tell us about signing up for classes now and drop out. How's that work? Well, so they just changed it a little bit. Now it's, uh, you have two, two terms originally to add classes. One you can add up to 12, or I think it's 13 hours, something like that. Um, and so you basically get roughly uh, three or four classes. And then after that, you have to wait about two weeks. And then you can get another one to add up to 18, 18, yeah. Um, but they do it based on how many hours you currently have. So like that determines what day you're going, you know, uh, how many years you've had. So that determines what time of the day it is. Yeah, it's pro- Probably just as complex, but simply easier because of how fast pace it goes. Um, I will say it's very nice to just click a button and see if they all go together. (laughs) Um, And and then now it's also, you have all sorts of things like ratemyprofessor.com. So you have a a Yelp for for all your professors and can see who you want to take to. We would have liked that for a professor Samachi that some of us. (laughs) I'd like to just say that. you talked to someone and said, ooh, don't get that professor. You don't want to go there. You know, so in other words, that was part of the whole drop ad process also. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> don't do that. Don't go there. Yeah, we, we had a network of people that yeah. we relied on, and you would just go, and here, I've got it. What do you think? Oh, that's fine, but oh, my God, you better do something about this person. Mm-hmm. Lexi, well, did you have an advisor to, to help you pick your classes? Yeah, so my freshman year, it was one of the things that was required for my program that we go and talk to an advisor. So I did it, and she gave me some of the best advice that I'd ever heard, just in terms of like my college career. But she told me how much I was paying for each class that I was going to. Like she kind of did a breakdown, and so I didn't skip classes in college because of that breakdown. So that was really good. My advisor was great, and then I'm now in the school public health, so we have specific advisors for that, and. My advisor has been amazing, and I talked to her. I went to her house on this last Sunday, and we all had dinner with my cohort. So it's bittersweet, but I've had some really great mentors at UNC and definitely some great advisors. Catherine, how much time do you spend through advisor? Catherine, Me? Catherine. Oh, sorry. Not much. Right. <laughs> oh, not much. Um, yeah, it was it was very mechanical. It was not personable. It was get the duty done. Um, it was, you know, a lot of paper shuffling. It was just not, a, it wasn't a straightforward process. It was kind of sloppy, quite frankly. I think that's been historic. <laughs> yeah. That's changed a lot. But <laughs> that's changed a lot for the better. I'm, 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 I'm hearing things that are, are very, very impressive, but I know that the advising situation has been uh, subject to a great improvement, and it sounds like it's occurred. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I will say, just to cut in, it depends on what you make of it. So it's necessarily, if you're not seeking it out, you won't see it. So like the programs that I'm in have kind of facilitated that, like really good engagement. But I know some people, that one, <laughs> necessarily don't even know how to sign up for appointments. So I've had to help. And so. then I go to the academic advising webpage. I see they have drop-in sessions, yeah. and I drop in, and I speak to someone, and they have always been super helpful and they've always answered my questions. So I eventually get around to using them. So I think there's been a, a great- How many of our there. students had an international experience, short term or longer term? Semester away, month away, summer away, any of you? I do not, I was supposed to, but COVID messed it up, uh, so. That's true. that's true. Before COVID, a very large percent of the current students get an international experience, whether it's a summer away, a semester away, or even a, you know, a couple of weeks away. Uh, that's very, very common out. Did any of you do international? No. No, I didn't know about the outside world. Yeah, I, didn't, I had no knowledge that there was anything available. Right. Yeah, that's changed quite a bit. We had international students, a few, <coughs> lived in Carr, as I remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, now there are quite a, a number of international students, or they were. I think COVID changed some of that, some of that as well. How about summertime? 
What did, what did you do to go in during the summer after, after school was over? Well, I didn't want to go home. Uh, but um, I spent my first two summers at Presbyterian Point as a camp counselor and uh, with some of my UNC friends here. And then during from junior year all the way through senior year, we had summer school classes in nursing school. So we were here on campus um, during the summer. Yeah. But what did you do in the summertime? You have very many, but how many? Those that you've had, what have yeah. you done? So last summer I had an internship but more importantly, I think this summer, I'm going to be um, biking across America. I'm starting in San Francisco on June 8th, finishing up in Washington, D.C., August 13th. It's um, for a philanthropy event. It's called The Journey of Hope with my, um, with my fraternity. And so it involves um, shared experiences with differently abled people. So that includes, like, we'll, um, during the day, we'll be biking, and then at night, we'll be playing, like, card games or um, having dance parties, playing sports with... Um, disabled people and so that's a big fundraiser for us and <clears throat> uh, it's from pie caps from all across the nation but three members in my fraternity are doing it along with me so that's impressive that's yeah. something that congratulations I thank you we had trouble biking across chapel hill yeah so oh, that's that's part of it um recently got a flat tube so i took it to the bike store realized my bicycle had a couple problems but we're going to get that fixed and ready for the summer so i'm excited Let's turn to engagement on campus outside the classroom. Uh, each of you, quickly, uh, what kinds of things did you do other than be a student or an athlete in, 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 uh, in Bob's case? I just spent time with my boyfriend. Okay. <laughs> ben, were you involved in? Well, I wasn't involved in um, any sports, anything like that. I mean, my first semester, as many of you remember, we had a water shortage. You couldn't flush the urinal. They were actually getting ready to send us home. Mm -hmm. Right. And then they did, then it started raining and raining and raining, so we didn't go home. Um, my first thing was to try to learn how to swim. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone had to learn how to swim. I had right. never been in a swimming pool. I'm from Eastern North Carolina. And when I got in the swimming pool, instead of going forward, I went backwards. So the so once we were sorting swim, I was trying to figure out how to go forward. Got an eye in the course had to learn my four strokes, did it the second semester and all. So I was really more involved on the academic side of the thing, you know, did attend some of the basketball games, the football games, but really was not an athlete. My uh, youngest daughter here ran all four years cross into an outdoor track here. So she's, she's the athlete in the family. Gwen, now you were involved. Yeah. Talk about things you did other than in classroom. From, from day one that um, we came, the nursing upperclassmen showed us the way. Um, they instilled upon us that we were leaders. We were, we were admitted here to be leaders, to serve. Um, and so Carol Norman, I remember Ann Belcher, were involved in um, the student government, involved in campus activities, and Morrison Dorham, uh, was our brother dorm, sister dorm, and we uh, planned activities together. That was the emergence of the residence hall concept, residence hall learning, uh, seminars in the residence halls, et cetera. But we were also focused on um, the, the campus was ready for change. And we, I came from small town USA, and it was a totally different, I, there were, the church I went to, there were women in leadership positions. That didn't happen in Oxford, North Carolina. Um, there were women in leadership positions here. I didn't see that in my small town. So it was really encouraging to me and exciting to say, hey, I could do that. And um, it was fun. And I, we met a lot of people um, and got to know everybody. And I think Jean said yesterday, you know, people were, would, could disagree, but they weren't disagreeable. Everybody was respectful. And it was wonderful getting to know people from out of state and uh, other than, you know, the people, the six of us that came from JF Webb High School here. Um, and they met people and we, you know, they would introduce us to each other. My roommate was from Asheville. I met the whole group from Asheville that came and they became friends. And um, so that's how it kind of grew and you got involved in activities um, that way. You could sign up for anything that you wanted to. It was not like you had to be 
a certain caliber of person or a certain characteristic. If you wanted to be um, in the Carolina Union um, series of entertainment, et cetera, you could do that. There was a lot going on in campus. And we were smaller then. It was 13, 15,000 students. So, um, and there was no bus, no cell phone, um, one call phone on the, on the, so the way you communicated and got things done was people to people. Right. Yeah. Kathleen. Um, Gwen, thanks a lot for that information because when I came in 1968 to the nursing program, there was no support. You were on your own. I mean, they told you kind of what you could do and what you two couldn't plus, do. Two plus two, yeah. Um, and um, of course, you know, my idea was that having had 12 years of all female school, <laughs> I wanted to go have fun. I mean, I had been under you know, a lot of rules and restrictions. So that was a priority to me. But what I found after I dropped out of um, nursing, because I found it not really um, inclusive and not supportive, and some of the things that they were suggesting I, I just didn't think were relevant at my 19 years of age. Um, and so I was really drawn to psychology. And then what I found in psychology, um, where my boyfriend was also involved, we got involved in community service in terms of I work with juvenile delinquents. You know, I worked with professors around different mental health issues. It was really a fascinating experience. And that's where I got my support. And what I found from my friends was it really was department-led or department-directed. Um, and Chapel Hill gave me um, Davy Hall, and I spent a lot of time there, and just felt like of a family. It was a community. Um, so what I would also add is that my junior year, I got elected as president of the Association of Women Students. Um, and it, had, it was only one years old. And as far as I could tell, not much had happened in an organized fashion in that organization. So I came back early, early August of our senior year to try to figure out, like, did I have an office? Did I have any money? Um, what, you know, what did I have? and started designing a program which involved a lot of different things to safeguard the women from what unfortunately was epidemic rapes um, on campus. And so if you might remember, class of 72, that the undergraduate library and, um, and Wilson Library had places that you congregated before you had to go to your dorm, so you were in a group walking to your dorm. And I put lighting on the campus, we had um, emergency phones set up. I don't know whether you remember all of that, but that happened our senior year. So women became much more um, involved, active from my standpoint. I think when you saw a different you know, chapter of it and a different angle of it. But yeah, that was a foothold. We had really got things going. You did. Uh, Joyce Davis was also a Joyce. Right. Yeah. Joyce, Joyce yeah. Davis. Excuse Joyce me. Joyce Davis was also in the same role you were in. Yeah. Well, then, let's, three of you both already talked about this wonderful bike trip. Tell us about some of the outside activities you've been engaged in or are engaged in. Yeah, so all four of us here are all members of the Order of the Bell Tower, which means that we are ambassadors to the Office of the Chancellor, and we're also tradition keepers on campus. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things that we get involved in are helping out with um, hosting the Chancellor's Box on football games. We lead tours of the Bell Tower. We also have a lot of events throughout the semester to try and help other people on campus to get involved in traditions. So for example, um, a couple months back, we had an event where we were trying to get everyone to complete the daily Tar Heels crossword puzzle, and we are giving out Sutton's hot dogs as a prize for that. Great. Oh boy. I'd say for me, like the biggest thing on campus is Fall Fest at the beginning of the year. So there's like over 500, I believe, don't quote me on that, but student organizations that are just all around campus, and some of those are led by departments, some by the schools, some just by students who are interested in certain aspects of something, you know, you have all kinds of clubs, anyone can find anything to do on campus if you're willing to look for it. So it's been kind of cool to see just the area of ways like my friends and myself have been able to get involved at UNC because I live, I live with seven other people. So we are all doing very different things. Like not one of us has the same major. So it's always exciting to get to talk to someone and hear what they're doing. But Order of the, Order of the Bell Tower is a big one for me. I'm also in Gilling Student Government. Um, I did musical empowerment my freshman and sophomore year. Just like any way that you could find yourself looking for something that you're interested in, there's a way to get connected at Carolina. And there's someone else that has a similar interest to you. So I think like going to Fall Fest and having kind of these events that UNC facilitates, it's like a great way. And 
just UNC is a great school. So there's all kinds of stuff you can do here, no matter your age. And so. also, there's always, always somebody in the pit advertising some sort of club activity, giving out free food, um, giving out hugs during exams or puppies to pet for like stress during exams. There's always something in the pit. So even if you're kind of intimidated about walking up to people at Fall Fest, that's another way that you can get involved. Do you know how the pit got its name? Anybody want to volunteer the answer? Andrew? So uh, after it used to be an athletic field, it, uh, it rained and it just kind of formed a natural pit in the ground once they started changing it, correct? Good try, wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> after the union was built and Josephus, uh, after the union was built, uh, and stu in, in student stores, I think it was, there was, they, they ran out of money. And so they did not put any bricks on the bottom of what is now the pit. And Bruce Strzok, who was a cartoonist for the DTH, started doing cartoons, you know, with characters and dust rising and named the area in front of Daniels Hall between Lenore, the pit. And it stayed that way even after money was allocated to brick it in, in, in I guess, recognition of its, its humble origins. But that's how the pit got its name. And you students know the trees there in the middle of the pit? We watch those be planted. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have about five minutes, a little bit less then. So I'm going to quickly ask us to, around Robin, what were the main issues of the day in our day and then issues facing students today? Start with, start with Ben. In loco parentis, the university is playing the role of parents. In four years, we managed to get rid of the campus code and modify the uh, honor code. Uh, the Vietnam War and the cafeteria was worker strike. Those were probably, for me, the, the big three. Gwen? Same, the same yeah. ones. And women's issues, of course. Hmm? And women's issues, of course. Women's issues and the um, women's handbook, you know, rule book. Yeah. Yeah. Civil unrest in the development of black studies. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, social unrest, uh, just to capture that, we, were, we came here during the Vietnam War. We came here doing tremendous social change in America, the, associate, the assassination of Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, the 1968 Chicago Convention, and also that uh, tremendous social unrest. And we were one of the leading institutions on moving the country forward with that. So the, 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 the social unrest that we had here uh, and really the institution of uh, black studies and really trying to diversify the university. We still got a long ways to go, but we've been working at it for many, many years. But we were one of the leading things. You know, we brought on campus, and many of you may not want to admit it, to see Stokely Carmichael, Angela Davis. I mean, that was radical mm -hmm. to have brought those people at the University of North Carolina. Oh, let's quickly down, Bowen. Okay. One, one more thing the draft was oh, the draft. The draft. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. The war in Vietnam, of course. Both four of you quickly talk about today's issues. Some of the folks are nearby. Some are, have come from a long ways away and don't necessarily follow the day-to-day -day activities on campus. So tell I us mean, what's going on with the issues today. Something I think is the biggest issue, and I, I think Andrew can agree with me, was the pandemic. Um, I was supposed to move into E-House, and I never moved in my freshman year, and I'm a sophomore now. So I will never get to live, or I guess if I want to, I could still, but I will never um, have the chance to live on campus. So um, living in an apartment my freshman year and now in a house <clears throat> along Rosemary Street. Although my sister mentioned that um, UNC offers the, the Fall Fest for clubs, me and Andrew had that offer to us online, if that. So it has been difficult to um, go out and meet people per se or find organizations um, that you have um, the chance to participate in but just something that I feel like I can re relate to um, the older class, I'll say, um, with just the word of mouth, like spreading clubs and information, because even with the Order of the Bell Tower, I found this out through my sister. So the pandemic, I think, is the biggest issue that I've faced. William. I would say that another issue that's come forward as part of the pandemic is student mental health. Um, that's something that's always occurring, but especially during the pandemic when we've all been very isolated, doing Zoom classes, not seeing friends as much. A lot of people were also at home instead of being on campus. That's something that's come up, and I think that the university is trying to improve. Yeah, I'd say to kind of go off what you guys say, racial and social equality is still very, like, 
needs to be pushed on campus. My freshman year, I had been on campus three or four days, I believe. I was at the Sunset Serenade, and that's when Silent Sam, Silent Sam came down. So I just remember like people being like, there's skinheads on campus. And I was like, what is happening? I just moved in. I don't know anyone. Like I didn't even know about the history of the statue. And so I just remembered, wow, like this is crazy. Like I'm in a place of change, like where people want change. They're pushing for it. And I was like, wow, like so cool to be a part of this. And then with Nicole Hannah-Jones, just like it just is unveiling like everything that needs to be changed at UNC. Like it's a great place, don't get me wrong, but there needs to be changed every day. So I'm glad that I'm at a place that is kind of pushing that change. Hopefully we're, we're, on, we're on good track. Andrew, we'll give you the last word. Uh, I would really echo a lot of my peers, but I also think uh, student involvement is a big thing. Um, personally, all of my class or a lot of my friends um, the, over the pandemic while we were all sitting at home on computers doing class, no one really wanted to get involved with campus life. So I went, I applied for stuff like student government, order the bell tower, and I got involved. And so now I'm trying to reach out to all my friends and do the same thing. So I want everyone to have their best four years here. Well, timekeepers told us our time is up. I wish we could go on two more hours. This is fun, folks, to talk about old times and what's going on with these great students today. And we have great students at Carolina today. We had great ones back then, too. <laughs> but I want to thank everybody for coming. Yes. I, I, I'm feeling guilty here. Do it. Uh, people think I couldn't have gotten a date. <laughs> <laughs> but I did get a date in my senior year. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. And my date has been my wife, my wife for 49 years. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you.